This one's quick, so let's get into it fast. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Brightworks. And today, spotting on the front lines of Coombe Valley is the Red Team's Armada leader. It's gonna be none other than Nizah. Nizah clocking in at 37 open skill, hailing from Canada, and going to be playing with some silver chevrons as well. An experienced player, to say the very least, and going for a triple mech start. Interesting here. Triple mechs does put you in a little bit of an energy shortage, so it makes a lot of sense going into that solar panel all the way on the other side of the map here. Spawning is the blue team leader, a name I'll say only once. It's 1V underscore X8C3R. Very catchy. Rolls right off the tongue right here. The blue team leader with a very bizarre name. I'd love to hear the story behind this. I always love when there's random names like this. They always have some sort of meaning. It's like binary or... No, well, not binary. Uh, what is it called? It's like hex or something. I don't know. There's, uh, there's always, it's always some code or something or means something to somebody. <coughs> Whoa, pardon me. Uh, anyway. Wow. Not sure what happened right there. <coughs> Red leather, yellow leather. Need to do some... Uh, some vocal warm-ups here, going too fast. Coombe Valley gonna be the name of the map that we're playing on today, a map that I'm sure everybody's well familiar with. It's one of those maps that's been around forever and everybody loves to play. It's a favorite of the pros because it's so well balanced. This map really does tend to have kind of two options for what happens. Either one of these side lanes will crumble and then we start to see one side fall and either the team can address that or they can push forward on the other side. Or what happens is somebody will end up breaking the middle and we can either see a Cerberus or just some pop-up cannons on the mid-ground here, and then that denies enough economy to eventually topple the lead right here. So I'm not sure which one it's going to be today. Too early to tell into this replay, but A-Polygon, going to be playing on this high ground here. A-Polygon, another name that I'm sure a lot of folks recognize here. Somebody left a funny comment, or maybe it was a Discord message, something about how sometimes the, uh, the same familiar faces do pop up, and a lot of times that's because, well, most of these replays are pulled from the Discord channel. So if you want to see your replay, if you want to see yourself in a replay, I'd recommend you join the Discord channel. There's a link to it down below in the description section. While you're perusing, you may as well subscribe as well. Helps the channel grow, helps bar grow. It's definitely uh, helpful all around. And of course, if you like Daily Beyond All Reason, I do post uh, almost every day. <laughs> Schedule got a little bit out of whack right there. Hopefully we're back to normal soon. But how about this game, huh? Transport carrying around a constructor in the back line here. We've got some ticks running around and scouting over the place. I think these will mostly be cleaned up. Yeah, nicely dealt with right there from Nizah. Cleaning up most of the harassment over here. It looks like there was one sent up north as well from Towns. Uh, well, they were all from Towns, but this tick rather was sent up north, however. And uh, I'm not going to find much value. Not much damage anyways. LLT is in base right here defending most of this. It could probably kill this metal extractor if it was going in the right direction. Uh, not gonna be the case though. Nicely done by a very large cinder block. The maroon player here for the red team who does manage to blast down that tick quite nicely. Oh, we're on a patrol command. Interesting. Hmm. I don't mind that actually. That, uh, that, that, uh, scenario where you're supposed to face off against three AI, this is how I beat that, was by producing a bunch of pawns and setting them on little patrol paths around metal extractors just to catch any units that happen to stray by. Let's check the, uh, you know what I want to see? Let's check the vision right here for the blue team. Well, this is a nightmare. The blue team suddenly very aware of the fact that there are now ticks running forward right here, blasting down metal extractors, lickety split, also getting into the back line. Very annoying, killing uh, at least a constructor, maybe two. They're trying for it. Mex goes down, nicely done. LLT in the back line here are gonna be unpowered as well because of the solar panels falling. What a nice bit of damage right there for those ticks. Yeah, I would say all said and done, three, four, five metal extractors all blasted down, including a constructor as well. Got to be well worth it right there for Nazar, giving up those very, very cheap ticks. They're not free. It's easy to think of them as free. They aren't free, but they're definitely very cheap. Going for some more solar panels in the back line here, by the way. Nazar setting up a little LLT defense, trying to capture these very valuable 3.5 metal extractors. Of course, holding onto these as tightly as possible is going to be extremely rewarding. It's a bit of a strange uh, change of pace in the middle of the map right here because it, while T1 is up, this geothermal is very difficult to hold on to. Obviously, a pressure point right in the middle of the map right here for both teams. It makes it very difficult to hold on to this, but whoever so manages to put a geothermal on here is going to benefit the reward of such an efficient energy production system, of course. But in the, in the late game, in the mid and late game, when T2 starts to come out and Cerberus starts to be built on here, this single-handedly can hold down mid. If you have proper defenses to ensure that the Cerberus doesn't get overwhelmed, it can do so much damage to any of the T1 and T2 units that it really can't be contested. It's a very tricky situation. One that's hard to remedy, and so it's good to see that Fast Forward is holding on right here. Looks like we had a uh, rover sneaking by into the back line here, eventually cleaned up here for Darkwing, who's sending out a couple of fighters here. We've got transports as well, all that good stuff. Love to hear your thoughts on the the uh, commanders can't be transported by T1. 
situation. Sort of a division in the bar community right now as to whether or not you think that's a valid thing or not. Looks like we're going to be going for some pop-up. No, we're going to go for heavy towers. All right, cool. I like this strategy. This is probably my favorite way to play this lane, just going for the heavy laser push. You can pressure with any of your regular bots like normal, and then you set down construction turrets to aid in all this. And once you get that chain rocking rockin and rolling, you can really start to tear these things apart pretty quick. You put down one of these, and then you put down the next construction turret, then you put down the next heavy laser tower, and you keep chain reacting those into the enemy's face, and eventually there's not really anything they can do. This is a bit strange to go for that, though, while you already have the Rocketeers here to blast apart these units, but at the very least, it will cement this, the static defense over here and deny this metal extractor. You can always eat your static defense, too. That was a commander sacrifice in the back line right there. It looks like Rise Heaven is going to be going straight up to T2. Oh, screwish. Taking some damage from that pop-up flamethrower turret, but eventually we'll degun it down, and so that will be the purple commander recapturing control over the midsection of this map. We do now have 1,000 ticks pushing forward here as well. We're going for heavy laser towers in the middle of the map here, but we're also going up against vehicles. Wolverine and uh, Shell Shockers alike can both outrange heavy laser towers. In fact, they can outrange every T1 static defense except for gauntlets and agitators. So it's a bit strange to go for heavy laser towers against a vehicle opponent. Against bots, it makes a lot of sense. It can be really, really useful as a zoning tool. I'm not sure how good, how much I like it, how, how good it will be against a vehicle commander here, but I guess it just depends on how well the micro is from our pink commander, Sefi, as we watch them get ready to engage this front line. There's not really a lot keeping this front up and running. There's one pounder tank. The other one did die. Mm. If these units get the proper connection, certainly these siege units could fall. Pawns making their way uptown. Running fast, faces pass, and they're homebound, trying to make their way towards Nizaw's main force right here. Trying to make sure that really nobody has claimed this this uh, northern section here. Town's on the way to. Moving the commander up north. I'm actually going to change course and head right down to the middle. We do have a Dragon Squaw, pop up Dragon Squaw over here as well, which is quite nice. Going to be setting up one of those static defense towers. Those lightning claws, very good for dealing with big clusters of T1 units. Geothermal has been claimed right here as well by the red commander. A little greedy stealing that from your yellow commander, but I don't think Polygon's really suffering too hard from it. Big old agitator battle, but the numbers are on Polygon's side. It's going to take a T2 or some sort of airplay in order to swing this in the favor of the green commander. In lower ranks, I might say you could catch your opponent off guard here with a sneaky transition. You might be able to pull off some sort of cheeky play with a couple of grunts or something like that, but Polygon far too skilled, far too much APM. I believe we get a little stats chart somewhere if I... Yeah, there we go. APM, 47. <laughs> Feels low compared to, for instance, uh, StarCraft players who go up to the hundreds, thousands. But you gotta remember, this is a much more efficient game. So 47, 50, 60, anywhere around that number is gonna be really, really high. Rise Heaven with 178, more or less. Depends what kind of army you're microing as well and how well it's being microed. All that sort of stuff adds up really quickly. A little bit of a grunt run by here. D-gun fast forward. The brown commander being overwhelmed as the grunts streaming out of the laboratory can barely manage to put a hit on these before they do go down. Yeah, those purple grunts getting way more value than they think we bargained for. But their mech's about to fall. Down goes the mechs. Each of these grunts costing less than the cost of a mech to manufacture. They're basically aluminum plates slapped to a laser cannon. There's very, very little going on under the, under the hood. They're basically a walking gun. Makes them very cheap and very spammable. There we go. Grunts finally cleaned up, but not before killing three metal extractors. Definitely paying for their worth here on the front line. Screwish. Oh, looking a little sore. 27% left on the purple commander. Has to be careful. Rocketeers, aggravators, they can blast down commanders quicker than you'd think. At 4% a shot, it's pretty pretty easy for them to kill a commander if you get a little bit lower on health. Not to mention, of course, LLTs do a huge sum of damage to commanders if they should stray within range of them. In this case, though, LLT is mostly just being used as an anti-spam, making sure that the Rocketeers don't get overwhelmed over here. Polygon doing a great job of keeping the pressure high. Moving the lab forward, that's another benefit of building these construction turrets. We did abandon that heavy laser tower over here as well. Glad to see that was deconstructed. It's a lot of metal. You don't necessarily want to keep that up and running. T2 coming up in the back line as well. Four constructors attached means these T2 mixes will come up pretty quickly here. Uh, about 23 seconds apiece, I want to guess. Let's see how close my number is. We'll check in a minute. Medium tanks, Janices, all sorts of stuff pushing forward right here. The hero LLT. <laughs> wow, actually killing three of the four of those units right there. Not bad for an LLT to take down a couple of vehicles, but that was... He's going all the way, cries out a spectator. And yeah, I think I have to agree, Volshack. Uh-oh, a little bit of trouble. 
gunslinger trying to get a line up here. Uh, uh, four. Boom goes the commander. Nicely done. Nice snipe with the gun or the uh, gunslinger right there. Leveling up that gunslinger quite nicely as well. Now it's a matter of cleaning up this base. This is an obvious weak spot now for the red team. Losing all of this means that the maroon commander is effectively out of the match. We need to see constructors handed over, maybe some wind turbines. Everybody trying to pitch in to try and save that commander. For the time being, Steffi is now in charge of contesting two different lanes, two different opponents. It's two versus one. And if that goes on for too long, the inefficiency will drown the pink commander in a metal bleed. Now it's a 2v1 on the southern side here as well, though, that's sort of balancing things out. It's distracting from this front line here, meaning that the red commander has all the time in the world to go up the tech ladder. We do have a T2 uh, advanced geothermal coming up and running. We've already got some solar panels in the back line. I think it's about time we deconstruct these. Uh, maybe? Well, I guess once this advanced geo is up and running anyways. Yeah, we're doing an AGO on 700. Where's the rest of the energy production here? I guess it really is just the... Just the geothermal and the solar panels. Huh. Well, all right. Once this AGO comes up and running, no reason to keep these these regular solar panels around. You may as well upgrade them either to advanced solar panels or just uh, go straight into fusion reactors if you could as well. Nizah, tired of contesting this northern high ground, going to try and lock it down with a bunch of static defense. That's going to be the yellow commander going down right there. Oh, no, pardon me. That's the green commander. Misannounced that one. It's the, uh, yeah, there's Polygon right there. That was the green commander going down. A huge sum of forces lost on the yellow side to kill that commander. Is it going to be worthwhile? Towns is in position now to intercept all this. Going to send the commander over to reclaim. Was that a good enough trade? I'm not so sure. Now this front line is in a lot of trouble. Luckily, there's static defense here to hold. We are starting up some walls here as well. This could be very useful. Keeping a little bit of that firepower out of the face of those pop-up dragons, Ma. The uh, flamethrower turrets here. Big old battle. Clash on the northern side, but Polygon manages to deflect the, blur the brunt majority of it. Constructors continuing to help out this T2 constructor moving around. Fusion reactor started up right here. We're almost finished with it, actually. About 50% of the way done. Reminds me of when I used to run marathons and people would say, you're almost there on mile 10 or something. A marathon is 26.2 miles, which is... I mean, you don't need to know how long a, a mile is if you're, you know, an imperialist uh, or whatever. <laughs> if you're a, metri a metricist or whatever. Um, but it's 26 miles, and so when you're... You know, maybe maybe 10, 12 miles into a race and someone says, you're almost there. It, uh, it really isn't very encouraging. Gunslinger causing problems on this northern high ground here. Actually doing a great job, yeah. There we go. Blasting down the lab and the solar panels and the LLTs, the shell shockers, and just about anything else it can find. And a commander over there. <laughs> ah, he manages to get him. Lying in the lurk like an alligator in thin water just barely manages to lure that that uh, gunslinger into range right there, and the commander does manage to get the D-gun. Nicely done by very large cinder block. That's a lot of patience to do that. I Certainly not the amount of patience I have. I would have jumped at every opportunity. I would have thrown that. I would have lost my commander and lost the entire high ground. Uh, that's the Maroon Commander, by the way, so it's good to see that this is actually up and running on the high ground here, because otherwise the, uh, well, the Maroon Commander was built over here, so hopefully these mechs get handed over, or at the very least get used to go T2. Maybe borrowing your teammate's, uh, economy here to go for T2 wouldn't be the worst idea. If you, if you borrow your teammate's economy to go T2, and then you give them T2, you upgrade all their mechs, it's probably a fair trade, right? I feel like that's well worth it. Continuing to reinforce this front line here, thugs versus aggravators and thugs and grunts. It's a bolder composition right here for the yellow com- or the- well, yeah, the yellow commander, the yellow composer. That's a fun way of thinking of yourself. And beyond all reason, you're a composer. You're a composer of the battlefield. Let's get some sediment shots, huh? Lightning tanks blasting across the battlefield. Perfect for dealing with a bunch of T1 stuff like this, especially if it's all clumped up. That was a fabulous trade right there. And the res bots are sealing the deal, making this as effective as possible. And we got a bunch of pawns jumping on this. Actually, the pawn's really, really dangerous. Yeah, that wave of pawns washing over all these yellow forces right here. Not eventually going to be able to clean all of it up, but certainly rebalancing this push and at the very least blowing some of the steam out of behind it, out of its sails. Wow, T3 gantry coming up. My goodness, that's a very fast T3 gantry. That's a Nizah going for a 14 minute T3 gantry. Almost going to complete it. Let's see when the time is. 14... 20-ish. 14-23. Wow. That is a quick fusion reactor. I guess if you've got this many metal extractors pumping out this much metal at the same time, you've got the AGO and the fusion reactor. 
Yeah, about 3,000 energy production and about 100 metal production is where I like to start producing T3 units. So I guess it makes sense, yeah. Just pulling it a little bit more risky, but because of the fact that Towns is fighting down on the southern side, I guess it means that Nizaf feels a little more comfortable going ahead and just teching up like a madman. Hmm. Polygon would definitely appreciate an assist at this point, moving in with those T3 units to break this front line, this T1 uh, front line, and then crush, crushing the base of the blue commander. Wouldn't, wouldn't hurt. Sheldon firing away in the center of the map. They're long-ranged condensed matter cannons firing away towards the forces in brown. Rattlesnake will be denied. Nicely done. Rattlesnakes can be very powerful. Ooh, Spybot on the front. Spybot going to be needed to save this. Yep. Ah. Uh. <laughs> Both forces not sure how to deal with these Marauder. Of course, those Marauder T3 are extremely, extremely fast. Seeing them on the battlefield has got to be concerning here for the red team. We're going for another fusion reactor. Okay. Going for some of that cheaper eco scaling here. Less efficient, but definitely cheaper. 4,300 to produce another extra 10 and a half, 10, 15 ish metal per second. More than that, actually. About 18 metal per second, I think, a fusion reactor generates if you convert all of it at T2 efficiency. Something I've been having a lot of fun with, actually, is not doing T2 efficiency. Uh, instead, just building tons and tons of T1 converters. You can only get away with it on certain maps, but when you can, it really does feel phenomenal. You just use butlers or just T1 constructors to build a bunch of those T1 V converters, and you just use them to convert your T2 economy. You just build fusion reactors, all sorts of stuff like that. As long as a single bomber doesn't find you. Yeah, it feels pretty good. Marauder making very light work of this front line here. Still, though, it is a numbers game, and there's plenty of hounds barraging away against the Marauders. It's about 3,000 metal. Uh, yeah, about 3,000 metal worth of Marauder up against about 5,000 metal worth of hounds. It's a nearly... It's a... Well, I guess it would be a 3 to 5 ratio. <laughs> Not an even number, per se, but it does kind of highlight the ratio of T3 to T2. T2 to T1 almost feels like basically a bedoubling. T2 to T3... Depending on what you're building, of course, it feels like a little bit less. There are obviously ideal engagements and all that as well. Commander gets sniped back here, by the way. That was just a bunch of wasp gunships. Fighters coming in to try and clash against those gunships, but they're too late. That's going to be the yellow commander going down. Not the end of the world, of course, but it is inconvenient for sure. T2 lab on the front left without build power. Anti-air missiles at least firing up into the air, trying to shoot down as many of those fighter planes as possible. Cool to see. Weakening up those fighter uh, balls. This is the word I'm going to choose to use there. Always quite nice. Jammer goes down. Uh, Mammoth costing 2,200 metal. It's an extreme investment to kill this with T3, but I guess it's worth it. If those Mammoths manage to snowball, it can be a real problem. Ooh, D-Guns from Nizah. Not able to reach. Oh, no. Can't fire high enough into the sky. Nizah uncloaking in order to do that and loses the commander in the front as well. Two gunship snipes right there, coming out from Potato 37th. 37th Potato ever made, showing us exactly how effective those Watts gunships can be in mass. Sniping away those commanders. Did we eat up everything on the front here? Oh, it sure looks like we did. Well, all right, if we're going to move everything back, I guess I don't mind it, but for the time being, Polygon is essentially not producing here. Well, effectively, yeah, out of the game. We've got Razorbacks coming up now. And I do think that's the ideal solution here. Marauder are great because they can jump on top of a lot of this stuff, but they really aren't a good skirmishing unit. Um, Razorbacks having a hard time here, though, too. <laughs> the wreckage is getting in the way of the Razorbacks here and making it very difficult for them to engage. Razorbacks also with a little bit of anti-air. means that the gunships are going to be slightly less of a problem. Very slightly. This is dangerous. Mass gunship wave headed towards the air player's base. With the air player unable to produce for a while, suddenly this is a terrible, terrible situation. Uh-oh. Darkwing's commander goes down. Gunship's making all the difference. T2 facility will be targeted down right here. T1 anti are not going to be enough to bring down these gunships. The T2 facility falls. And we're shooting down the gunships very slowly, but it's not enough. 
Oh, it's not enough. The gunship's still tearing things apart back there. Brilliantly done by Potato, managing to completely swing this game out from underneath the red team's grasp. I think this T3 transition was meant to win the game, but in the end, it actually ended up costing so much to maintain. And with the Marauder unable to do damage, with the Razorax completely EMP'd, that's going to be a brilliantly efficient trade right there for the blue, purple, and green commanders as they push forward on the southern side, getting ready to continue the aggression. A single Razorback, oh, another Spybot, brilliant. That is lovely stuff. That's how you come back into a game. The Spybot really is the ultimate comeback, comeback maneuver. Razorback falling. Scorpion turret putting in some serious work here. Wonderfully done. Really, really wonderfully done. At this point, Resbots are going out on the field, just going to try and sustain this T3 economy based on resurrection or uh, reclamation, either one. It's not the worst thing in the world, but it definitely leaves you wanting for a little bit more. Rise having going for some more eco with the backline here. Eating up a bunch of those solar panels. Getting ready to build some more advanced fusion reactors. Not a bad idea to have a dedicated eco player in the back here, just spamming out a whole bunch of units. Unit spam like this can be unilaterally useful if you manage to put it all in the right spot and at the right time. Sometimes it can be very tricky to figure out if you're in the right spot at the right time, though. Easy to misjudge that, and suddenly you find yourself in a situation where really all you can do is uh, build T1 units and there's not much else. Another big fighter wave coming up. The flat cannon firing away here at as many of these fighters as possible. Bombers coming forward. Oh, looking to deploy their payload. Ooh, and away goes the fusion reactor. Just barely not killing that uh, T3 gantry. I think if the third bomber had managed to connect right there, probably would have been able to sweep away that, that uh, T3 gantry quite nicely. Unfortunately for the blue commander, not going to be the case. Still a nice hit to the economy, though, for the red commander. That's almost half the energy production here. Yeah, just about half the energy production, as well as this geothermal, actually. So that's about two-thirds of the energy production overall going down. Nuki bees. Love that. <laughs> it's my favorite term for nuclear bombers. Nuki bees. A little bit of a push on the southern side right here. Soup du jour. Trying to run forward with a whole bunch of fiends. We've got Sheldon support here as well. I actually like it. There's not really anything holding this back, actually. Yeah, I mean, that bull was supposed to be the line of defense here. The beamer turret giving it its all, but it is underpowered. And suddenly... Four or five feet to blast down the entire T2 production facility right here. All right, we'll take it. We will certainly take it. These feet need to get moving. Oh, yeah. Headed towards the geothermal of the blue commander. If this geothermal pops, it does put a little bit of a hamper on the blue economy here. We have an APHIS up and running, so it's about a fourth of the energy production of the blue commander, but still, losing that geo definitely hurts. And also, of course, that explosion radius is massive. Hurts on go boom. What was it? Not sure exactly what popped here, but Razorback also pushing forward on the right-hand side. Oh, Spybot overcharged or overtuned. Yeah, a little bit too early is what I mean by that. Getting getting a little overexcited, that's the word. Ooh, abductors in position to EMP. Dang, that hurts so bad. Abductors shutting down your very expensive T3 units, and just like that, these Razorback are forfeit. That hurts. That hurts badly. Nizal losing a cool 11,000 metal worth of T3 units on the enemy side of the field to just a couple of T2 aircraft. If the EMP bombers are uh, bad day nowadays, and they are, at the very least, the abductor is still powerful. Wow, the morale victory. My goodness. No overwhelming push, no nuclear strike, no influx of units, but the morale of losing those T3 units and being overwhelmed on all fronts meant that eventually it'll be the blue team that takes the victory. Looks like there's some salt mining going on as well, and that's always fun to see, too. I sure hope you enjoyed today's game. It was a bit of a quick one, ending at 23 minutes, certainly quite a bit faster than a usual match, but definitely showcasing that even if your enemy goes for that very quick T3, there is always, there's always a way out. Thanks a ton for watching. I hope you enjoyed this 5 bots, and I will see you in the very next game of Beyond All Reason. Peace out, everybody.